Okay, so I'm going to be very brief. I just want to, to give uh, uh, you know, a warm welcome to everybody who is here. It's very good to see so many really great people in the past. My name is Maria Jorge, the head of health, who is hosting this beautiful seminar today that has been curated and organized by my colleague Katarina. So everything happening today is being thanks to her. Uh, the title that we have here now is a little bit different from the one I saw in the abstract, which I started with a very catchy phrase of why leader. And it's uh, the topic many of you many may already know is pretty much on top of everybody's agendas. Precisely this week I've been discussing with other colleagues within the faculty about the United Nations priorities in terms of uh, sustainable development and waste is very important there. So we are looking, we will be looking for interdisciplinary agendas to look at this. And I think that the talk we're going to have here today is, is a very good example of what we can provide from our section of humanities, literature, history, but we're going to see all these themes in, in this talk. So thank you very much, Katarina. Thank you very much for bringing this amazing speaker. I mean, we are looking forward to this. And I'll see you afterwards. So I'll leave the floor to Katrina and there is wine afterwards. So don't rush on Thank you very much, Maria. And thank you so much to Crowd for hosting this. Um, and for the help of the organization, thank you to Nancy as well, who has really done the legwork in terms of providing transport, accommodation, room bookings, and everything. And good evening to all of you and welcome. This is the inaugural seminar the 2022-23 Narratives Programme. Um, this year we'll have the theme of Ecological Narratives and Narratives of Sustainability. It's lovely to see you all here in person, but hello also to those of you who are watching um, online or over Teams or who watch the recording afterwards. My name is Katrina Stoka. I'm a lecturer in 18th century literature here at the University of Greenwich. Together with my co-organisers, Dr Justine Bailey, Justine and Dr. Emily Critchley, who's joining us online. I'm delighted to welcome and introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Emily Chumba, who is joining us from France, where she is a senior lecturer in English literature at the Université de Picardie Jouvel in Amman. Dr. Jumba's research expertise is in 18th and 19th century literature, with particular interest in the writings and career of Joseph Addison the 18th century author and politician, and in the history, material and cultural, of paper, waste and recycling, the topic on which we'll be focusing today. As well as organising conferences and speaking at international seminars and colloquia, Emily has published scholarly articles and chapters in a variety of international venues. Recent publications include 18th century paper, the Reader's Digest, in an essay collection deliciously entitled Bellies, Bowels and Entrails in the 18th Century, a street by Barra, Klein and Lapp, London, Bassett, and published in Mount Street, in 2018. There's also Read, Wrap, Burn and Wipe, the Impolite Waste of Periodicals, in a collection called Impolite Periodicals, edited by myself, Emrys Jones and Adam Smith, and forthcoming with Buckingham University Press in the year. A few practical notes and a brief introduction to kind of the rationale for what we're doing here today. First of all, and um, just to remind everyone, this is a hybrid seminar with both an in-person audience here at the University of Brentford's Old Royal Naval College and an online team space for audience. Um, and if we have any glitches, I'm really kind of darting up to the front to fix things, so apologies in advance if that happens. As I've already said to the people there, we'll be recording this talk and so you can be aware of that hopefully. Um, and it should run for about 40 minutes with a further 20 minutes or so for audience questions thereafter. For those of you who haven't joined us previously, the narrative seminar has been running for two years now, which seems hard to imagine. And after last year's series focused on translation, transnationalism, border crossings, Justine, Emily and I are delighted to inaugurate, as I said, the series on ecological narratives. And it's a topic, as Maria already suggested, that intersects uh, with our own research interests in a variety of ways. And we also hope, of course, that it will allow us to engage further with the many crucial conversations about how we live 
in and with planet Earth that are happening across so many different disciplines, concepts, and fora. Um, and I should say that we're happy to welcome David Jackson from the University Sustainability Team, who is joining us online today as part of a conversation about how we might contribute to the university's strategy and working in that area. I myself, um, as a final very quick moment, sorry it's gone on too long, um, I'm particularly thrilled to welcome Emily to Greenwich. We first met as co-presenters co of speakers on the panel at the 2019 meeting of the International Society for 18th Century Studies and bonded over our shared enthusiasm for Joseph Addison and interdisciplinary and high growth methodologies. The conversation started then and since flourished with a series of online teaching exchanges where I taught at Vinkuji uh, Vu and Amelie has spoken to my master's students um, and two visits I made to Amelie's institution, a uh, visiting lecture in 2021 and more recently a funded state soliciting scholar again to Amelie. Well, we began to, to research what will be a fantastic joint interdisciplinary project concerning the aesthetics of waste in the long 18th century, exploring untapped archival sources and what they can tell us about how waste spaces such as mountains, middens, heathlands and woods were valued and used in the 18th century, as well as mapping some of those practices onto our current assumptions about natural spaces today. After two delightful and fruitful visits to Paris and Amina, I am thrilled to be able to introduce Amelie here at Greenwich. And so with no further ado, I'll hand you over to Amelie and her paper entitled The Evils of Abundance, Paper of Reuse in the Long Beach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it, I shall, um, is it okay if I stand here? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, sorry for deleting why litter. I, I thought it was a long title. It, it sounded too 18th century-ish, and I deleted it. Um, I shouldn't have. Um, I'd like to thank Greenwich University, Katerina, for inviting me and um, allowing me to um, to have a captive audience. You're not allowed to interrupt me. It's, it's just so beautiful. It happens so rarely. Um, I'd like to, to thank my, my co-researcher, with whom I've been researching waste paper for 14 years, Jeffrey Day. He's allowed me to use some of the materials which will become a book um, in the near future, I hope, if we find a publisher. Um, the title of the present paper makes a rather obvious point that thrift motivates recycling and creates less wasteful consumption. In the same spirit as Susan Strasser, um, here in her work uh, on waste and want, which focuses on uh, 19th century American practices. Today, rather than advocate thrift and economic scarcity that has been done by my, my French president recently, wearing turtlenecks and uh, talking about the end of uh, the days of abundance, um, uh, or even promote the benefits of apocalypse uh, for our modern consumer society, um, I'd like to analyze the past and why and how thrift was lost. I've included plenty of pictures, I promise. Definitions first. Um, in the 18th century, the concept of the environment, the awareness of finite natural resources and space did not exist, appearing far later with the envi environmentalist movement uh, of the 1960s. Keith Thomas has demonstrated that the idea of the natural world was evolving in the 18th century. But without the concept of shared space, uh, shared resources, um, there, are a there is a plurality of causal links which cannot be established. Um, that is apparent in when in 1854, Dr. John Snow laboriously succeeded uh, in proving that a water pump in Soho Broad Street was the single source of a cholera outbreak um, by dint of statistical evidence such as this map, uh, and trials, um, such as stopping access to the well and observing the decrease in cases. It took much time and lengthy arguments, even a pamphlet war, uh, before the leaky cesspools and water pipes of the area were repaired so as not to contaminate the well anymore. The difficulty in establishing a link between water, sewage and cholera in the mid-19th century can be more clearly understood when looking at judicial records 
that are far earlier than this instance. In 1716, the correlation between uh, the pungent taste of the water drawn from a pump near Bridewell Royal Hospital and the presence of sewage in the ditches and wharfs close by was made, but this did not rouse fear in the petitioner's mind, only distaste and discomfort. Um, the water which the petitioner Caldwell does pump for the use of his family leaves such a fulsome smell and taste of dung that the very meat dressed therewith becomes loathsome and not eatable. As with most occurrences of the word uh, noisome or, or fulsome in judicial database, uh, the citizens' concern focused on smell and the air quality, but not on the water and the people. And the petitioner continued to drink the water from the pump. In the 18th century, the word pollution meant something altogether different, uh, a moral and religious act of desecration, defilement. Because 18th century consumers preserved papers, bones, metallic objects, rags, cinders, and animal fat amongst other materials for future resale or reuse, that did not mean that the water they drank or the air they breathed were cleaner than ours. They were differently polluted in the modern sense, to name but a few instances of this phenomenon, um, lead pomatums and makeup, uh, mercury pills to cure syphilis and small clay pipes for young children. Dirt and cleanliness, waste and value are obviously relative. <coughs> Dirt is famously defined as matter out of place by Eileen Douglas. Um, waste can be neutrally defined as what you pr presently cannot use. The most important element of that definition being yourself, as in the directions you call left or right. Consequently, consequently, waste provides a negative definition of your consumption, culture, social class and gender. The modern definition of and behaviours leading to litter, likewise, remain relative to this, to the place where this reality is perceived. Uh, in that document uh, issued by Zero Waste Scotland, uh, litter is defined as waste in the wrong place caused by human agency. And a sense of personal responsibility for litter is stronger or weaker depending on the type of space. And it's a key influence in the phenomenon of littering. Moreover, the word waste in 18th century did not always mean that something was considered dirty or useless. Instead, it signaled a potential for reuse far more than an inconvenient reality. And I agree in that respect with Sophie G's optimistic definition of waste. You can see that in uh, expressions such as waste paper and bad copies in some printers account books. Um, these expressions mean nothing to us nowadays, unless we remember that waste paper had multiple uses and an economic value. And in the case of bad copies, a specific role to play in the printing process. It is tempting to uh, oppose our drastically altered habits of consumption and disposal, as in this lovely Twitter picture, to 18th, cent 18th century practices of reuse. In the early 1780s, young Francis Place raked the gutters in a street of his neighbourhood to find old iron. On one occasion, I raked the kennel of a street at the back of my father's house, Water Street, which led down to the Thames. In close proximity to the river, uh, Water Street must have conveyed a fair amount of accumulated waste and Place's efforts must have amounted to mudlarking. The profit he made from reselling the old iron he found allowed him to buy paper, glue and decorations with which to make a kite which he then ostentatiously flew in the long fields outside the city and sold to an envious and richer boy for a much greater sum. Yet Place was by no means destitute. Uh, he went to school and his parents kept a public house in Rundle Street. The practice of raking kennels for profit is reflected in Hogarth's prints and paintings here uh, for noon. 
There is nothing in this kennel um, but organic matter, uh, liquid fouled by human and animal excrement and one animal carcass. Cat's carcass. Similarly, the final lines of Swift's often quoted city shower poem mention putrescent waste only, sweepings from butcher stalls, dung, guts and blood, drowned puppies, stinking sprouts, all drenched in mud, dead cats on turnip tops. These visual and poetic depictions suggest that some sorting has been going on. However, the kennel did not always lead to the river. Um, pigs appear to have been kept within the city, even though the practice was prohibited as early as the 1720 Act of Parliament. The numerous edicts against their rearing and complaints brought before the magistrate attest to their continued existence. Um, this 2013 PhD thesis uh, on the subject of horses and livestock in London makes the point that pigs would have considered this waste food. Another use was still possible, although occasionally. Uh, Tim Hitchcock quotes the unpublished manuscript paper of Francis Place, who set up a tailor's shop in Charing Cross in 1801 for 20 odd years. Uh, Francis Place was able to observe the behaviour of Londoners, notably the practice of collecting refuse to sell it to the crowd, who then proceeded to pelt those sentenced to the pillory. Um, even urban waste could therefore revert to the status of commodity and become a prop for street entertainment. But we can quote judicial accounts um, and many satirical prints, dead or live cats appearing as the most expressive projectiles. Um, I've got a lovely, um, uh, sorry, I've got a lovely um, um, passage about dead or live cats in in the continuation of this particular unpublished paper. Um, this particular passage. Um, highlights the fact that there was a commercial transaction, at least in the beginning of the pelting. And further down this passage, um, you, you realise that um, the notion of the environment and what was part of the environment or what had a, had a almost human consciousness varied uh, a lot. Um, a dead cat was a treat, a live one was a still greater treat and a woe to the poor animal who fell into the hands of the miscreants. It was, however, soon killed and its carcass thrown about as long as anyone could get hold of it. Um, of course, Francis Place illustrates that that change in, in the sensitivity in, in people's awareness of what was the environment. Um, getting ahead of myself, sorry. Similarly, the existence of mudlarkers and cinder sifters mentioned in the OBP, depicted in satirical prints, demonstrate that uh, the cycle of reuse le led to a relative cleanliness in uh, the, uh, the, paved area, the paved area of London. Um, Tim Hitchcock um, claims that if the streets of London were clean and well ordered, this was largely down to the beggarly poor who recycled and reused any item casually dropped upon them. Um, this watercolour by Thomas Rowlandson might be said to be a satirical, therefore unreliable representation of Rockfair Lane. Rockfair Lane was a meeting point for religious minorities, here most obviously Jews, for scavengers, and their impecunious customers exchanging secondhand clothing and other wares. The passageways in this depiction are not paved, but neither are they filthy or littered. The lane is picked clean like a carcass. The elusive phenomenon of waste was, as it is today, space dependent. Away from the paved centre of the town, scavengers and street sweepers unlawfully dumped their gatherings in back streets, as well as in the many lay stores in, in the city, or they lawfully left their loads uh, upon the mounds of the dung hills, such as this one, in an empty field on the side of Tottenham Court Road uh, in John Rock's map, um, drawn in 1746. 
waste was moved where it was no longer dirt in the eyes of the respectably short citizen. Waste also retained an undeniable value. The lessees of London's laystalls paid to acquire the lease and a fixed annual sum to boot, £10 per annum for the Eastfield laystall in Mayor Street in Hackney in 1723, for instance, as in um, this extract. The current project is to map and date as many as possible as these temporary grey areas where relative categories shifted and where money was exchanged. Um, the long fields around the city, the dung hills, the lay stores, and here, um, the Victorian dust heaps. But let's move on to paper because this, you know, this is the real subject of my talk. Uh, the enforced creativity that paper uh, displayed. Handmade paper requires a regular motive power, very clear water, a plenty, plentiful source of rags, and therefore a populated area that would produce it. Access to an urban area to sell the paper, temperate weather, and a very skilled workforce, especially the couches, who are supposed to balance the form properly. These ideal conditions never simultaneously materialised, and the number of paper mill bankruptcies in the 18th century is quite staggering. Nowadays, it still takes a long time to make handmade, properly sized and dried paper, about three months. Throughout the 18th century, English paper mills were not able to meet their home market demand, and paper was imported from France, Italy and the Netherlands. It continued to be scarce even after the first patent for wood pulp machine made paper. The start of the mass production of paper mid 19th century represents the end of an era of scarcity where paper was preserved. Which means that before that time, paper was in, had found a myriad uses and reuses in urban locations. Now, provincial accounts, provincial account books indicate that Paper was, was even scarcer in the countryside, where three quarters of the population lived in, in 1700. Uh, we know that um, Richard Latham, for instance, um, a small yeoman farmer, um, wrote only one recorded letter over 43 years, and that was to his daughter in 1730. On one of the 20 sheets of writing paper he bought the previous year, he bought another 12 sheets 27 years later in 1757. Uh, in urban centres, uh, the situation was a little bit different. Paper was more common, relatively, and always absolutely of, rel of some value. Um, now you could call it bricolage, um, if, you, if you're a fan of, if you're a Levi Strauss fan club member, uh, you could translate it loosely as making do. Um, you could use Susan Strasser's um, notion of stewardship of objects, which is quite useful. All these, all these various concepts, which you find formulated in secondary sources, um, try to make sense of the luxuriance, the exuberance of 18th century recycling practices. In the domestic sphere, and in kitchens particularly, um, Paper was used to light fire, to light and clean pipes, to wrap spices, and that is a nod to Horace, where in, in one of his poems, it is said that spice pepper is carefully preserved in folded papyrus. Um, and here in, in these depictions, uh, on the left-hand side, an illustration of a stern sentiment, sentimental journey. This is supposed to represent a French kitchen in Amiens, um, you find pieces of chopped garlic on a piece of paper. In the right hand side, uh, print uh, made by an Italian artist, you probably have grated cheese onto a bit of paper. Uh, and I disagree with the uh, British um, uh, Museum curatorial comments here. This is not grated turnip. Um, <laughs> in the kitchen, Paper came into contact with food. Um, it could be used to wrap butter and cheese, to close up jam and mustard pots, to filter water and liquids that was used by scientists of the time. 
and to insulate meat from the scorching heat of the fire. They use that as, uh, that is attested as early as the Roman times again, when um, you could cook um, mackerels uh, wrapped in wetted papyrus um, in, a, in, a, in a slow fire. Here you find a realistic and not realistic depiction of, of, of roasting meat. We know that the, the little pins attaching the paper to the meat are realistic because they're mentioned in cookery manuals and they're criticised for allowing the juice of the meat to fall. But what's not realistic is the writing on the paper because most cookery manuals indicate that it would have been brown recycled wrapping paper, lower quality paper, stronger paper, thicker paper and not writing paper, um, which costs quite a lot more. Um, that is my star quotation, um, and um, may, maybe some of you know it, it's the utmost bricolage in terms of cookery uh, in a phenomenally uh, popular cookery manual by Hannah Glass which first appeared, appeared in 1747. Uh, everybody, even contemporary cooks um, and, and um, competing cookery manual authors, criticised this particular recipe and said that it was absolute fantasy. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm presenting it to you. As, tell me what you think about it. Uh, so you take a, di a dish called a necromancer and uh, you line it with food you pour boiling water over it, and then you hang the dish on the back of two chairs by the rim and burn 15 pieces of brown paper over the course of 15 minutes. And lo and behold, uh, the meat is cooked. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, I'm tempted to try. Um, so paper appeared whenever there was DIY in the house. Um, if you could not afford glass panes, of course, you had oiled paper windows, uh, such as this 1718, 1789 print. Um, oiled paper uh, windows in satirical prints symbolize poverty, of course. Um, but also in printing houses and any uh, environment where paper had to be kept slightly humid when it was printed. Um, this here on the right is a um, satirical print by Paul Senby. And you do see that um, the target of this satire, uh, i.e. Hogarth, has reused um, the paper from his art books to make a paper window. Um, paper windows were all for exactly the same reasons, keeping the humidity inside, were also used in silk weaving, weaving workshops to keep the silk humid and therefore um, to prevent it from losing weight and value. Paper windows were also uh, used in brothels for privacy, obviously, and for the same purpose uh, they were used by coiners. You find mentions of paper window in judicial records. But you could also make oiled paper cloche or bell jars to grow melon, um, as in that wonderful gardening manual by Gilbert White. You could line tr trunks, boxes, drawers, shelves. Um, you find remnants of such waste paper in archival boxes and libraries. Um, and we know from the OBP that trunk makers bought quite a lot of waste paper on the black market. In the other rooms of the home, paper was in close contact with the body. Paper could line clothes. Um, I have found a mention of a paper cord for wigs to absorb the sweat and so as not to sully your wig too much. That's, but that's a French source. I'm wondering whether you've seen that in an English one. Paper was used, of course, for cosmetic purposes, um, to curl your hair, as in here, this wonderfully satirical reuse of Newton and Locke's works. And for medical, um, and also for paper of patches, patches which were made out of fabric were stored between two leaves of paper, they're called paper of patches. Medical uses could also be possible. 
Um, there is a medical use in this painting. Can you find it? Can you spot it? No? It's on the bottom. Has anyone seen it? Yeah? Yeah, well done. Um, I quite like the fact that the, the piece of paper disappears in print and reappears in the bonnet of the butcher helping the lid. Um, we know that this is a piece, a piece of um, print because somebody who's been to the museum and has peered close enough to the painting told me that the word interest can still be uh, uh, deciphered. So this is a fragment of electoral pamphlet being used as a um, cataplasm or plaster. Um, it was used on wounds to provide an adhesive covering and it was wetted with alcohol, possibly gin. I don't think brandy would have been used unless it's a particularly luxurious uh, uh, electoral um, entertainment. If, and so brown paper was mostly likely used because it was because it was thicker and it could keep a poultice into place in place. In affluent homes mid century, the spread of three distinct papier mache making techniques, shredded paper, pulse paper, laminated paper, enabled the cheaper, more quickly produced imitations of expensive stucco decorations that were pinned onto walls, ceilings and around mirrors. We know from the earliest paper, paper um, we know that, sorry, the earliest papier mache manufacturers, a Mr. Wilton and Thomas Bromwich, of course, used paper sourced from failed publications and ephemera, as well as thicker browner varieties of paper used for wrapping. The time bracket um, of such production is interesting. Um, one 1747 artifact we've been able to observe contains material published as early as 1700. If paper use, reuse, was motivated by economy, it also existed because it made sense given the availability of material. In affluent households, households, sorry, reusing one's correspondence to protect a book bought and bound made sense, it was not uncommon. Here, um, you have a, a French library, 18th century library, where a letter to Leiden was reused uh, as end papers. I will not quote uh, Alexander Pope's sending fruit wrapped in his manuscript translation of Homer. This is constantly quoted by, at, at all the paper conferences. And Pope is not representative of the general 18th century population. He was a paper maniac. Um, in the public sphere now, um, there are numerous instances of paper reuse in the paper manufacture and the book trade. The circulation of waste paper between the paper mill, the printer and the bookseller was designed to minimise financial loss. Defective paper wrapped requires of good paper. This is a ream wrapper being recycled to wrap a notebook. Printers use the foul sheets to check the evenness of the ink, to wrap type and to protect the piles of collated copies. Commissioning authors or booksellers receive the waste and or surplus paper from the printers and disposed of it. We've got materials example of that. Um, we have a, here a possibly Dutch ream wrapper reused and this is quite rare because ream wrappers were by law to be destroyed so as to avoid defective paper being illegally sold as proper paper. Um, and here you have foul sheets uh, used to pad a book cover. Inside you find some music and French grammar. Um, outside this, these interconnected manufacturers and trade, waste paper elicited a continued commercial interest. We see this with judicial records and anecdotes in the press. Uh, in the OBP, in a 1784 case, John Duffy, a vellum binder, uh, was asked if there was um, any chips of paper laying loose in the shop and he replied, it is always my custom to take up the chips of paper, those shavings are valuable to us, we sell them for 22 shillings a hundredweight. In another case in 1789, in the OBP, a printing house employee was accused of paper, paper theft. 
and he declared that he sold the sweepings to Hansen Fleet Lane. Even the press recorded uh, the Stamford Mercury in 1772 recorded instances of poor a poor woman who maintains herself by picking up waste papers. These must have been the lowest of the low, but paper allowed them to earn a relative living. As well as an economy, the reuse of paper was a visible element in the urban scenery. Uh, we have this quite extraordinary, uh, extraordinary sorry, um, painting by Henry Morland that reflects the eerie glow of paper lanterns in the hands of a ballad singer. And we know that on May Day, um, when milkmaids, milkmaids sorry, and chimney sweeps paraded through the streets, we know that the chimney sweeps wore paper lace tucked into their sleeves and colours. Kites were also a popular uh, pastime and appear in many prints. This is in Hogarth's Noon. Once again, it's in the uh, upper hand, right hand corner. And print, we know that print was involved. Recycled paper was involved in their making, um, not in the main body of the kite because it had to be beautiful, it had to be blank. Um, but as small bows with which to weigh the tail and give it stability as it floated. This is confirmed by a surviving Dutch kite discovered in the 1990s in Leiden. And we know that it was made in 1773. And one of the frame bows displays uh, fragments of possibly a Latin scorebook, which would make sense given that it was probably made by two boys or two children. Far more than kites, lanterns, or lanterns, sorry, wrapping was the most visible function of waste paper. Wrapping the vast quantities of wares, food being sold in, in, in the city. A small portion of an already quoted print that, by Paul Sandby, drawn um, in, seven, sorry, published in 1753, illustrates how paper was part and parcel of the general consumption of goods in the city. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure about the reliability of, 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 of this depiction because it's a, it's a satirical print, yet um, if you go from uh, left to right, uh, you notice several uses. Um, on the right uh, is a pie shop and um, someone is wheeling uh, Hogarth's work on the line of beauty, um, so as to be, um, to be used to wrap the pies in which the chimney sweep is eating. Um, then a trunk maker is taking away a uh, batch. It is sold um, by the hundred weight. It is delivered by a cart. And that is the most, on the, on the right hand side, is the most beautiful, but perhaps the most unreliable depiction of, of a waste paper dealer. I'm, I'm absolutely not sure uh, this is a, a, um, a realistic depiction. I don't know. Um, the OBP trials, for the, the Old Bailey proceedings, um, where you have trials for paper theft, demonstrate that only a fraction of these thefts came to light and to a trial. Therefore, an unfathomable amount of paper was being stolen from warehouses and printers' workshops to be sold on the black market as waste paper to cheesemongers, pie makers, chandlers and grocers. A further proof of that is the stable black market price of waste paper throughout the century, according to the OBP, between threepence and threepence halfpenny a pound. Consequently, we know that antiquarians uh, used middlemen like John Backford, Joseph Ames, to source rare books from, the, from these locations. Um, we could also name John Ratcliffe, a Chandler turned book collector and seller, who also operated as a go-between, transmuting waste paper into collectible artefacts. Um, the Old Bailey proceeding throughout the 18th century and later uh, make it clear that the makers of wrapping paper were far from producing sufficient wares to meet the market demand. Um, the serendipitous nature of the discoveries of theft 
the extensive time lapses between the theft and the realisation suggest that a lot of pilfering went on unnoticed. It was normal to buy waste paper every day and according to the retailers, they, they were never able to buy enough. The situation continued throughout the first half of the 19th century when there was no decrease in the frequency of trials at the, at the Old Bailey for paper theft uh, to sell for wrapping. Again, um, the buyers were cheesemongers predominantly and the thefts were inside jobs. But a big change was, was that the 19th century saw the rise of the wholesale waste paper dealer. Apart from a small number of individuals mentioned in the account books of printers, um, Henry Rhodes, the boy ledgers, we have very little surviving evidence of 18th century waste paper wholesalers. And they almost, it's, well, almost all of the time they tend to come from uh, religious minorities. Um, writers on 19th century paper, such as Leo Price, have depended on the testimony of Henry Mayhew, which is rather unreliable. Conversely, the OBP provides witnesses uh, that give evidence of the oath and provide detailed testimony. But the thriving 19th century wholesale waste paper dealer and trade uh, has yet to be properly investigated. Um, the courts recorded considerable increases in quantities of um, in the quantities of waste. It was a part. It was partly a response to a government bureaucracy. The Stamp Office in the 19th century chose to dispose of its records as waste paper. Um, government departments generated so much paper that long-term storage was out of the question, and the quantities were so considerable that only wholesale waste paper dealers were able to cope. We have um, the testimony of one Ursula Davies, who in 1834 said that she held contracts with the excise office for 20 years and um, paid 28 pounds per ton. 10 years later, Joseph Mahon, who described himself as a wholesale stationer, um, declared that he deposited 30 tons of large bundles of paper. Um, we know that he had a separate warehouse in, in Great Suffolk Street to store the waste paper. Where the largest 18th century thefts were recorded in hundredweights, and there were only very few of such size, during the 19th century, the quantities came to be routinely expressed in tons. The wastefulness seen in the bureaucracy was mirrored by the domestic setting. Um, 18th century servants and housewives had waste paper drawers where they, they, they preserved the paper carefully. Their 19th century counterparts had the waste paper basket. And here there's an interesting gender revolution um, because the practice of wasting paper became masculine in the depiction of intellectuals. I think, therefore, I waste paper. Um, a good deal of the contents of these waste paper, paper baskets was the result of a general increase in letter writing and literacy. Um, whereas Horace Walpole is thought to have sent and received around 8,000 letters during his lifetime, um, the proprietor of the London Musical Agency in 1884 testified that he would receive 1,600 letters uh, in a day in winter. That, of course, was made possible by the introduction of the Penny Post in 1840, where you could send a, any letter up to a certain weight uh, for anywhere in the country for a flat fee. And um, whereas Walpole's correspondents uh, folded the sheets on which they had written the letter to write the address on the outside of the paper, thus saving paper, the 19th century uh, saw the um, introduction of the envelope, which when you look at its diamond shaped, is already a waste of paper by its very production. Um, we know from records um, of, of account books and paper mills 
that uh, the production of, of envelopes exceeded 12 million per week in the 1870s in just one um, in just one uh, manufacture. Witnesses at the Old Bailey uh, described pretty much the same reality, uh, a common wastefulness. Envelopes are thrown into the waste paper basket the moment the letters are taken out. Um, for a literary uh, depiction of this wastefulness and destruction, read Charles Dickens, I think. Uh, but I haven't had time to read all of Dickens, but it's there. Now, as, as a conclusion, um, um, I will say that the 18th century was not cleaner than, than today uh, from our scientific criteria, but the agents and the networks of reuse were far more efficient to reclaim waste. Um, brackets. Once paper reuse became less common in the course of the 19th century, and if you look at this early depiction in 1835 where there is already litter on the pavement, it was abandoned altogether uh, after uh, the Second World War with the advent of single-use plastic, and thereby an interrelated network of craftsmen, merchants, thieves disappeared and cease to operate the circulation. Today's recycling is not grounded in material need. The usefulness and cost efficiency of recycling is doubted, apart from that of glass, some metals and paper. And even then, uh, these are a minor part of what we dump. Plastic is the major problem, but do we lack plastic? Today's recycling practices are mostly social, uh, based on peer pressure. But a minority, they stem from um, aesthetic enjoyment, attachment to the concept of nature uh, the, in urban minds, of course. For a majority, littering stems from the ignorance of environmental damage or might be thought the concept of the environment itself. Thank you very much. <laughs>